USCHO.com. Welcome to USCHO Weekend Review for Monday, March 4th, 2024. This podcast is sponsored by the NCAA Men's Division I Frozen Four, April 11th and 13th at XL Energy Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Visit NCAA.com slash MFrozen4 to get your tickets today. The final four regular season champions have been crowned. Bemidji needed just two points to win it outright, but they swept Minnesota State with two shutouts, 6 nothing, and 2 nothing. We've been talking about Bemidji kind of creeping up in there. And uh, they have been on fire as of late. Well, congratulations to, to Tom Saratori and the Bemidji State Beavers. They had to go win it. And that's the, that's the big thing. It was, it was uh, one-on-one, one versus two. Um, granted, they only needed, a, a, I think, one point or two points. But they went out and did it. And they did it in style. I mean, both shutouts. Usually, that's a, a Minnesota State-type uh, win. You know, not giving up any goals. And, you know, we've been we've been talking about Minnesota State for the last couple of years, but uh, good to see somebody else win that uh, trophy, win the CCHA. And I said congratulations. I guess we'll be saying the congratulations a lot this week, but I think that was probably and I'm glad you have it first, the most impressive because of how they did it with the scores and doing it to Minnesota State. Yeah, you kind of stole my thunder there. You, you, that's usually what I do to you. Um, but that was exactly what I was going to say. I, I guess the other thing to add in is how impressive Bemidji was down the stretch to put themselves into a position to win this weekend and doing it, as Ed pointed out, in style without allowing a goal. I mean, 6 nothing, 2 nothing. That's really impressive. Um, they're rolling into the playoffs. Um, they might be... Uh, the best team in the CCHA right now and, you know, should be, uh, yeah, I know number one seed always is usually the the favorite, but that's a very close league, especially we'll get into it, the middle of that league, but they really found a way to separate themselves from the rest of the pack. Well, it's no surprise the way they've been playing, the way they've been turned around under Adam Nightingale, but Michigan state won its first ever big 10 title five, two on Friday over Wisconsin, the Badgers got the split on Saturday, four to one. It's the first regular season title for Michigan State in any conference they've been since Ron Mason led them to the CCHA title in 2001. So it's been a while. Yeah, I mean, that's that's I I, I don't want to say it's not it's surprising or not surprising because we've seen this turnaround since the beginning of the season. People had Michigan State tabbed as a top 15 team since day one. And they've continually moved up. And Adam Nightingale's done a fantastic job um, with this team. They closed it out in the first game. Didn't have to worry about uh, night two. And the Badgers, you know, credit to Wisconsin, they bounced back. Um, but now, I, th- this is the one conference that winning the conference means so much. Getting an entire round off while everybody else has to play hockey. Now, I think it it can be a little bit tough because then you go into... Uh, a semifinal do or die and the other teams have been playing for a week in a playoff, you know, fashion. So it may be not the easiest, but uh, I like Michigan state's chances too. They are really rolling right now. I'm really surprised with this. I'm surprised at the fact that they hadn't won a, a championship under Rick Conley because they won a national championship. So that's really surprising to me that uh, that happened. So to have that in, in their Feather in their cap. They win a national championship, but not a regular season championship. That's uh, that that's pretty impressive itself. But uh, once again, an- another congratulations to a team that has almost led start to finish wire to wire. Um, they had Wisconsin was there, but Mich- Michigan State was always there, nipping on their heels. They kind of took over a little bit, and they've I think they've kind of punched themselves potentially if they do well here down the stretch as a number one seed. Yeah, I, I think that they are. They're in the catbird seat for that. Obviously, if if they meet again against Wisconsin in in a tournament game, or if they were to get eliminated in a semifinal game, maybe they lose that that uh, number one seat. But they're in the they're in the driver's seat to get it. North Dakota clinched on Saturday. They swept Western Michigan five to three and three nothing. Uh, Commissioner Heather Weems was there at the Ralph to hand over the record sixth Penrose Cup for North Dakota. 
it, yeah, and we've seen this coming. And um, these last two are leagues that were clinched in CHC and Hockey East with the whole week still to play. Don't forget that they, both of those leagues are, are not in playoffs this upcoming weekend. Um, the, it's that that's the way to go out and, and do it. And we were concerned after that sweep of Colorado college, I'm sorry, the sweep by Colorado college uh, a couple of weekends ago now, but then they win four in a row to kind of retake control of the league, clinch the title um, and separate themselves. And now I know you can't rest and stuff like that. That's the one thing about college hockey. It's not like the NFL that you clinch something, you know, with one week week left and you can rest some of your key players. I don't think you can really do that here. If you have some injuries, maybe, it's, you know, keep guys out that were borderline to come back or not. Um, but in, in general, you can't really rest players because of your pairwise position. Um, but North Dakota, another team, you know, congrats to them. That's, that's pretty impressive that, you know, you've basically won half of the titles, more than half of the title, more than half of the regular season titles in the history of that conference. Um, that's, that's, there's something to be said about that. You want to run another couple seconds and take everything I was going to say? You you got back at me on that one, but <laughs> no, I mean, I, there's really nothing to add. That's, this is another one that, you know, had a little blip, but then they write it. I mean, the ship has been righted there and they've got four in a row and over some, opponents that they could have stumbled on western and i know we'll talk a little bit about where western's fall but that was a that's a big sweep for for north dakota and to, to continue to win the nchc championships regular season championships big for them boston college has been phenomenal this year with uh, probably the most talented lineup in college hockey a sweep of new hampshire five to three and one nothing and by the way that sunday game had uh, some impact uh, all up and down through the through the pairwise, moving people up and down a spot after that game. It was fun to watch that. But anyway, uh, BC clinched Hockey East for a record 18th time, and Steve Metcalf got to hand out the hardware to the Eagles. Yeah, I'll be I'll go first because uh, on this one, so I don't I I know Jimmy can go in depth, and I won't be as in depth on Hockey East as him. But I watched the game yesterday. What a big time goal that was to win the game. Uh, I was I'm sitting there and I know Jimmy was on the broadcast, but I'm sitting there thinking, is this going to go to overtime? There's not much going on. I think you guys just said it on the call. There wasn't much. The shots were like four to four. And lo and behold, they uh, pick up, pick up the puck and go coast to coast. And and here we are in a nice backhand goal by the defenseman there. And uh, there you go. You got the championship and Steve gets out and I, I thought he would grab the microphone. I was a little disappointed, grab the microphone, maybe he's saving it for the garden, but uh, just a kind of a, just a, and I know Steve listens every week, so I'm going to give it to him. Probably a little lackluster uh, trophy presentation on my part. Not as impressive as uh, Heather Williams that uh, the night before, you know, you know, literally taking the mic, calling over the captain. She did it all. Um, no, Steve is, Steve is a man of few words uh, sometimes, especially when it comes to presenting trophies. I believe at the garden, he won't have a microphone either. So we got to work uh, on that. Maybe the peer pressure of calling him yeah, out. I mean, it, him a- it, it could, but you, you, you nailed it there with a, you know, Eamon Powell's goal. You know, there's so many players that can create highlight real moments on that team. And, you know, he, he works a give and go with Ryan Leonard. Uh, and, then goes top shelf from the backhand. This is a defenseman. And I know he's talented and he's one of the fastest skating defensemen. Um, but to finish that one off the way he did, he phenomenal uh, play, and, you know, and, and for the captain, he then gets to, you know, receive the trophy after the game. Uh, we got to talk to him on the broadcast afterwards and, you know, says all the right things. Um, but it's, it's a good win for BC and it shows that they've not been winning one, nothing games this year. They've been winning games, you know, six, two, five, three, you know, four, one, uh, they can, they can definitely shut an opponent down, but they're usually scoring. I think it was going into it. I think it had been like 11 or 12 straight games. They had scored at least three goals and in a bunch of those games, they were in five or more. So to to win a game one nothing shows that they can get into those tight situations. They have been playing really well in the third period in the second half of the season, um, and that is something that's that I think is makes you a little bit battle tested. You know, when you can win games, you can find the game winner when you need it. You can 
find uh, the insurance goal when you need it. You can lock down and put away games. I like this BC team right now. And you mentioned pairwise. The one thing I, I was surprised after the game, that really separates BC from BU in the pairwise too. And they've got a real good lock on a number one seed. I, I talked about resting players. You don't want to do it in the in case of the pairwise next weekend. If if BC were to lose, I don't even think they can drop out of the number one overall seed with a loss next weekend in, in a single game against Merrimack. Well, let's turn to some teams that didn't have quite such a great weekend. Uh, St. Cloud State and Western Michigan both swept uh, the Huskies by Denver, which by virtue of a split with uh, Michigan State and Wisconsin moved Denver into the fourth overall spot in the pairwise. And Western Michigan, as we talked about, swept by North Dakota. So that puts put St. Cloud State now on the bubble at 14 and Western Michigan just outside at 15. Yeah, I mean, for Western, that's probably the biggest shocker. That was a team that we're not too far off from when they were, I think we were talking about them in the 70% to get into the tournament. So they've quickly played themselves out and they, they got out outplayed in that series pretty bad. Those were lopsided games. So, you know, to, to fall down to 15, now they've got a ton of work to do um, and they're going to have to do it uh, in the playoffs in an unenviable position. They have to get out of their quarterfinal series now. There's no choice. If they can't get out of their, their quarterfinal series, um, they're probably done. Maybe they could, you know, scrape something this weekend in the final weekend of the regular season to try to move up a little bit. But I feel like they have to get to the semifinals or their season ends. Let me ask you this, and you're the math guys on the, on the pair wise, and I, it's probably what everybody's thinking. Western Michigan's got Miami, which they should take care of business. And St. Cloud's got to go to Minnesota Duluth, which is in-state rivalry, always a big one. Say Western gets two and St. Cloud splits. How would that affect it? Does Western, Western could then jump because I think they're pretty close yeah, to they, where they're, they're 14. And then both of them got to get out, right? Wouldn't you say both of them then would have to get out? And then yeah. you potentially have somebody like Cornell maybe waiting if they have a good run to, to pass them both if they don't both get out? It's potential, you know, I mean, because look how far Western's dropped lately. It, yeah, it's it's significant and it's it's surprising and it's quick. It's happened quick. It you know, the, the one thing we can. I think if, if, I, if I'm looking at my math, we can definitely say Western's going to have to do that in the quarterfinals from the road. St. Cloud State is likely going to be at home in the quarters. Um, so, I, yes, they both probably have to get out of the of the quarterfinals to have a chance the chance is the possibility is there that they'll play each other though right now they're aligned to play one another in the quarterfinals so it, that could be a, a almost a play-in series for the ncaa tournament here's the thing though if western is the road team wins Our count bonus. a bit more for them yeah. so they could move up more with some wins or even a you know a, Say they win one. Well, it's a best of three. If they win only one out of three, they're in trouble. If they win yeah. two out of three, they can move up. And that would probably push St. Cloud right out of it. Yeah, The, the head to head. If, if they play one another, it literally be, it, it probably becomes a series for the team that moves into around 13th in the pairwise. And the other team would probably drop from wherever they are down to 15, 16 and be undoubtedly done. I knew I had a good question for the you math. Did. That guys. was a really I good missed. question. That was it. And it made, it, it made me look at the, where the, the potential pairings are right now. And that's, there's a lot that can change this weekend with wins and, and stuff like that uh, and losses. But right now, you know, you're talking about Western heading to St. Cloud. Cornell lost to union on Friday that slid them down after the weekend to number 16 in the pairwise, uh, just a tiny, tiny chance right now for an at-large bid if everything falls in the right way, but they probably have to win the ECAC tournament. And even the, the best of three that's coming up in the next round is not going to help them a whole ton. I mean, it'll help them in winning percentage, but not much, if any, and may even hurt them in strength of schedule. But uh, Cornell just, Derek, just like three weeks ago, we were talking about them being right in the mix and here they are uh, on the outside looking in. Yeah, it, it's, it's really interesting. We just talked about Western with a slide. Now we're talking about Cornell. Like, and we said it, said this last week, we thought that their schedule really set them up 
to kind of go on a big run. We said and, maybe even three weeks ago, Derek, we said this, you know, I yeah. mean, we looked at their last six regular season games. We thought that they were in the best position. Yeah. But now you're, now you're looking at a team that's really hot, like a Dartmouth who snuck in there. I still, I still am going to go with that. That cut line is going to be 13 and it's going to come from, I mean, it's going to come from either, I think this conference, but it has the potential of the, um, I guess it doesn't have the potential of the CCHA. It's going to come from here. It could come from here. Maybe the Big Ten, if say Notre Dame went on a run and won that tournament, or maybe Hockey East, if New, New Hampshire or somebody down in the bottom, like a Northeastern, went on a run. But um, yeah, that you know, this is this would be the, the most likely team to move the cut line. Cornell gets hot in the playoffs, gets through their quarterfinal, goes to Lake Placid, wins a couple. Um, and then, and then they're in. Um, they almost have to, right? Oh, there's no, no there's. I mean, you're talking 4%. about a four percent chance uh, to mathematically get in as an at-large. That's that's pretty minute. I mean, you have to have a lot of things fall in your favor. Yeah, and, and like literally, we were. I don't even think it was three. I think it was longer than that. We thought that they had the ability to go on an maybe an eight no run. If you look, they had RPI Union which you thought the hardest one we thought was the trip to the North country where yes. they went. Oh, one and one, but right. then the Yale, the Yale one was a difficult one. Um, and before that, that's, they were kind of on a roll, you know, heart, uh, Harvard, they beat the tied Dartmouth. They beat St. Lawrence and Clarkson. I mean, it, it basically came down to that tie against Yale and then to go to the North country and go, Oh, and one. So they went Oh, one and two. And 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 where they really needed to pick up some wins. I, I will say I've been saying it for a couple of weeks now, though. If they get in, and they'll probably be somewhere around the 14, 15, 16. Oh, uh, oh, oh no! Number one, no number one team wants to face. Team, no way. No, no way. We've got some teams that did really well this weekend and helped themselves. We'll do that when we get back. This podcast is sponsored by the NCAA. Men's Division One Frozen Four, April 11th and 13th at XL Energy Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Where are my hockey fans at? Presents. Welcome to Fandom 101. It's NCAA Ice Hockey Championship time when the hottest teams in the country face off under one roof. Be there to see your squad hoist the ultimate trophy overhead. The NCAA Men's Frozen Four, April 11th and 13th in St. Paul, Minnesota. Attendance is encouraged. Passion is mandatory. Buy your seats today at NCAA.com slash mfrozen4. Class dismissed. We're back with USCHO Weekend Review. Some teams really helped themselves this weekend. Uh, we mentioned Boston College in their sweep of UNH, almost a lock for the number one overall seed. But Jim, as you referred to, quite a gap between them and number two, BU, really cements them pretty strongly in that number one spot. Yeah, in the RPI, they're more than two one hundredths of a point ahead of BU, which is really, that sounds really far. Um, it, it might not, I'm sorry, it might not sound really far. It's, it is. I'll give you a context. The margin between number one and number two right now is greater than the margin between number 10 and number 18. So the, the bottom of this pairwise is a lot closer than even the one to two spot. So uh, like I said, BC can almost, uh, they, if they lost this weekend to, to Merrimack one single game before they go into the hockey's tournament, they're still likely the number one overall seed. UMass uh, swept UMass Lowell. I got to watch you on the call Friday night, Jim. Both wins came in overtime, though, so it didn't help them as much as it could have. But it improved the Minutemen to 12th in the pairwise. That means they're now in as a three seed, the lowest of the third seeds in a regional, and also close to 90% to get in. Saw them moving up and down a little bit. I think they dropped as low as 14th over the weekend. Getting them in a third position in a regional seed is something everybody really wants, especially the committee. Uh, it would just solve so many problems. You know, if you have two seeds from hockey East in the East, you want to keep them East. And if UMass was the fourth seed in Springfield, which they, as the host, they'd have to stay there. You know, you, then you're shipping BU out to uh, St. Louis area there and Maryland Heights. And 
um, you know, it, the way you want this to go is BC in, in Providence, BU in Springfield, uh, North Dakota in Sioux Falls, and whether it be Wisconsin, Denver, or Michigan State in uh, the uh, St. Louis area regional. That that all plays into the committee's hands. Everything else is is a hodgepodge of a mess to have to move teams around. So, um, yes, you'd like to see uh, UMass hang on there. They have that weekend series at Maine this weekend. Uh, a good uh, split up there for, for the Minutemen would probably solidify uh, that third seed a little bit better heading to the playoffs. And we, you talked about St. Louis region. There's really nobody close there, but St. Louis, me being from there, Wisconsin is a massive name there. Uh, they used to have a hockey camp there, which which sold out every year. Mike Kemp, and congratulations to Mike on his retirement. I don't know if we hit that a couple weeks ago. But I'll tell you this, that's a big Wisconsin base, not too far from Madison. And if they really want to move tickets in that region, which I think that they're having a tad of a problem with right now, that that would be a massive one to have Wisconsin in St. Louis. Whether a four seed, whether a five seed, that would be all red. Uh, and that's that's where it is. And and finally, you know, you talked about you talked about Maine. They've got to get start, get right. They're on a little bit of a steady downward uh, tick. We need to they need to get right as heading into the hockey's playoffs and heading into the NCAA tournament. Colorado College had a tie with and a win over Minnesota Duluth. The Tigers now in the eleventh position. They're another one who is moving up and down a little bit over the weekend. That puts them in decent shape, better than two-thirds chance to make the tournament. Uh, That really helped them this weekend. And you got to really like Chris Mayotte's Tigers this season. There's no doubt. I love Colorado College this weekend. I had a chance to actually run into some of uh, of their old staff this weekend uh, over at uh, the Bentley-Robert Morris game. And we were talking about it. You knew that they could do something uh, once Chris Mayotte got there. He's done it quickly um, and really... You know, given his his team a fighting chance to return to the national tournament, that's something that they, that that fan base out there, they're I don't know how to how to describe them because I really enjoy going out to Colorado Springs and 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 games in those arenas out there. They always felt a little bit passive, but when they're really good, boy, they're an excited fan base. And right now, they're really good. And this is a team. We talked about Cornell. You wouldn't want to meet them in the, the national tournament if if they were a four seed. I don't know if I was the number one seed and I had to face Colorado College that I'd be that happy with it either. I mean, they've got some signature wins in the second half. We we played Minnesota after they they did, so we had a chance to to kind of see them uh, on tape a lot, and they were kind of in that eighteen range. And they're massive wins. They got that big win at Minnesota, and then uh, they just kept rolling a little bit with sweeping Miami, sweeping Western on the road. That was a major one for them that really started to climb that their they started their climb. And then to to sweep North Dakota at home was was big for them. So this is a, a team that potentially they're they're winning one, losing one, tying one here, but that's a team you don't want to face, whether it's in the tournament or in um, the NCAA tournament. One conference got its playoffs underway last weekend. Atlantic hockey began with uh, a game I think both of you guys were at on uh, Saturday, Robert Morris pulling off the upset of number six seed Bentley, 4-3 in overtime, and not just in overtime, but with 10.1 seconds left on the clock in overtime. And I know, Derek, uh, uh, you saw that one very closely, but Jim, you were there as, uh, as an innocent bystander. Why don't you? Moral support. Moral support. Um, yeah. Well, that- you, well, I don't know. Were you with moral support for... For Derek, or were you moral support for our friend uh, Dan Rubin, who was on the call for Bentley on that game? Well, I, well, I, I think I was I was his uh, emotional comfort animal uh, for Dan <laughs> Rubin, <laughs> particularly after the game when he needed a few uh, vodka sodas to to get through the loss. Um, no, I you know I was really their moral support for both coaches. Andy Jones, is a good friend of mine as well, and obviously schools uh, was really happy for you, buddy. Um, you know. I, I thought that, you know, your your team, Robert Morris, came out strong, never trailed. And I think in a playoff game, when you don't have to chase a game, that's always 
uh, the preferred method in these one and dones, and you never trailed. You got that three one lead, and Brentley, listen to credit to Andy Jones and his team, they fought back, and in that third period, they had it going. In that crowd, the atmosphere in that electric. It was it was a playoff game. Fantastic, you know, probably a thousand students, Bentley students there, and they don't have a huge student body, so that was a a really good uh, student turnout. But it, you know, I thought that Robert Moore's withstood the the barrage. And once you got to overtime, despite the fact that territorially, uh, Bentley probably felt like they were they had a lot of control. I thought you guys had some good opportunities, and then you know the unfortunate thing. A giveaway by a goaltender late, maybe overplayed the puck a little bit, but your player takes advantage of it. Uh, and Robert Morris moves on. I thought it was for to. I haven't seen a lot of Atlanta hockey playoffs in recent years. Um, just between you know lack of games in my area and uh, you know timing, I haven't been able to get to some of the buildings to watch. That was as good. Of a, of a college playoff game as I've seen in a number of years. And I wasn't going to talk about this, obviously, but I after the first period, I went in to our, our team and I said, this is fun. Like, this is, this, is, this is college hockey. You had the band, the fans were going crazy. You know, obviously, we kind of shut them up at the, and got a uh, one nothing lead and turned it into a 3-1 lead. And, but they were, they, were, they were into it when they tied it 3-3 and they were into it all over time. So it was... It was a really, really good college hockey game, and that's. I'll leave it, leave it at that. Um, we're happy, and and I'm uh, excited to. I went through Dan Rubin. Now I got to go through Ed this weekend at, at RIT. <laughs> I just want to mention what a great job Andy Jones did this year to turn around a Bentley program that I think is moving very strongly in the right direction. Yeah, you know, I live out here in Waltham, so Bentley's you know, the closest school, and though I don't work in that league. Um, and I, that was the only time I got over to that arena all year. Uh, there's a there's a more of a buzz in the community um, than there had been. And I and Ryan, Ryan Sodequist was a, a great friend and a good guy. Um, but there was a, there's a buzz, and you know I saw a lot of local youth hockey parents and youth hockey players in the stands to go along with those that massive student population that was there. Uh, I hope that continues over there. Um, you know. Andy Jones is a good guy, good coach, and I'm glad that they've they've got that program back in in relevance uh, in Atlantic hockey. Well, I'm, I'm going after Ed, and that's what it comes down to. This is me versus Ed. <laughs> uh, it, it, no, it, you know what? It, it, it goes that way, but that's playoff hockey in college. You get like we got more play out of our overtime win. We've got close to fifty thousand views on that goal, and uh, excitement, excitement of playoff hockey. That's what it comes down to, and. There's nothing like college hockey playoffs. Uh, it's it's really and and the, the best thing was it wasn't during spring break. Their were, fans were there, people were there, and there's nothing like college hockey playoffs. And you see it day after day. So um, that, I was, uh, it was great. It was a great atmosphere. The only thing that wasn't great was the the bus ride on the way home, which got us home at nine a.m. You don't have a chartered plane? No, nope, no PJ this week. Private jet. <laughs> <laughs> Elsewhere, uh, Canisius won 5-2 over Mercier's Niagara 4-1 over Army. Both move along. Canisius will be at Holy Cross. Niagara will take on Sacred Heart. Already predetermined was AIC at Air Force next weekend. And then Robert Morris travels north to RIT for a best-of-three quarterfinal series. Looking at the CCHA, they're going to be heading into playoffs. But, Jim, you brought this up, how close the ending was. Bemidji out in front, but second place to seventh place in the standings were separated by just five points. And that's less than one weekend series. That's nuts. Yeah. I mean, when I looked at the final standings of where everybody fell, I mean, you know, every coach in that league from two to seven can sit there and say, what if, you know, at the top, you're saying, good thing we won those games. But at the bottom, you're saying, what if we had won those, you know, what, that game or two games, you turn, you know, three point loss into a three point win. Suddenly, you know, instead of being in seventh place, you're in, in second or third. I mean, that, that was, that is one of the craziest. We, we saw it coming all year, right? We, we, how many times did we say everybody in the C, CCHA feels like they're at 500? That, so I guess maybe it shouldn't surprise me as much as it did, but 
what a what an ending uh, that ended up being, and and it sets up some really good playoff series this weekend. Yeah, we were talking about Bowling Green a couple weeks ago, and then they end up having to go on the road. Uh, right. Yeah, it's it's yeah. We were we were talking about Bowling Green and their comeback and being playing for the title, and then they get swept by Tech, and then here they are on the road. Uh, so, I guess it it just shows you the parity in college hockey. We always talk about college hockey having parity from top to bottom, and and there you go. I I don't know if you get any closer than what happened in that league. Speaking of the CCHA, how about St. Thomas when they get into this? The league championship is as far as they can go. They win that. They're still not eligible for the NCAA tournament as they transition from D3 to D1. Do you need to fear the Tommies? Rico Blasi and Tom Saratori should be the two, only two finalists for coach of the year in that league. At 100%. 100%. A hundred percent. You know, I, I know that there was some obviously great play in that league, but uh, Tom, you know, what Tom Saratori did to get to the top, uh, what a second half they had. Um, but Rico has done a fantastic job building that program really quickly. Uh, you know, basically three years from bottom to near the top of that league. Well, before we wrap up, what playoff games are we looking forward to this weekend? And Derek, we can't say ours. So what are you looking forward to other <laughs> than your team's playoffs? I just kind of alluded to it, the Bowling Green Tech series. Bowling Green and Michigan Tech. Uh, I think Bowling Green's got a lot to prove after being swept a couple weeks ago. You got the Austin Swankler uh, story subplot. I'm I'm looking forward to that one, minus the... Uh, uh, red, white, and blue versus the brown and orange. I, I got to go with maybe this one's a little bit off the board, but it was not that long ago that Wisconsin really struggled with Ohio State. And now they get them. Now, this time it's at home, but they get uh, the Buckeyes. Uh, maybe it's a revenge tour here, a little bit for Mike Hastings and his, his crew, but um, it, that I guess if you're going to have one opponent that could have scared you if you're Wisconsin. Ohio State was that opponent. I'm going to uh, turn to Atlantic hockey. Surprise, surprise. But it's because this one has a little bit on the line. Niagara at Sacred Heart. The Purple Eagles went into Martiri Family Arena when they had still just taken the wrapping off the building uh, and won that series to move on to the semifinals last season in Atlantic hockey. Uh, I think the Pioneers are going to be looking for revenge. They've been pretty steady, but not. I don't. I don't consider them spectacular, but a very steady and and successful team this year. Niagara has been up and down. Which perps show up will determine what happens there. It looks like we're going with the revenge tour theory. You know, I I, I told Jimmy the other day. I, hey, I used it as revenge when he picked Bentley to beat us three to one. <laughs> so on on your Edge prod podcast, I guess when you were giving us the low the the big payouts for betting the betting the money. Um, Robert Morris would have made somebody a lot of money this week. If, if you could have found the line anywhere, which we <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's going to wrap things up. Uh, Derek, we'll see you in person this weekend. It'll make for an, in- it'll make for an interesting Monday. Yeah. Won't it? Yeah. Next week. Yep. Uh, people are already asking what was this Monday going to be like? And what is next Monday going to be like? So <laughs> next Monday should be fun one way or the other. Yeah. I'm kind of hoping it's more fun for me, but I'll feel bad for you a little. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. I know. Take off your take off your orange and and black uh, glasses this week. That's well, you sure. know what? I just hope it's great hockey, and I think it will be. It will be. Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by the NCAA Men's Division One Frozen Four, April 11th and 13th at XL Energy Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. Visit ncaa.com/mfrozen4 to get your tickets today. For Jim Connolly, for Derek Schooley, I'm Ed Tresker, and this has been USCHO Weekend Review.